Welcome to Mercy Hill Church Online. My name is Anna and I'm your service host. We are honored that you have chosen to worship with us today through our online service. Whether you are watching this via our live stream, on our website, on Facebook, or on YouTube, we are glad you are here. Before we jump into the service, I want to encourage you to take time now to share this service with someone else. Here's why. We know that the gospel message is powerful and life-changing and that sharing this service will enable more people to hear that powerful message. Let's kick off our service now by worshiping through song as we sing about how God has been so faithful. Hey church, today and every day our God deserves to be praised for he is a faithful God. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So as we sing and as we worship him today, let us do that in remembrance of his faithfulness for us. Let's sing this out together.
I know that for some of us, isolation has brought us back into fear or sorrow or anxiety. But we can always look to the Lord. His word promises, he promises us to us that he will always be faithful. That he's a God who pursues us and that he will never leave our side. So as we sing this out, let's declare his faithfulness over us. so faithful. His mercies are new every single morning, and in that we can rejoice. We're about to hear a powerful message from Romans 8, but before we jump into our sermon for today, I want to encourage you to check out our Equip seminars. Equip is all about providing practical, biblical, and theological teaching to equip everyday Christians to live out their faith in daily life. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about Equip, or maybe you've always wanted to check out an Equip class, but haven't been able to because of finding childcare. Maybe it's an issue where you couldn't get to one of our campuses on a weeknight. All of our Equip classes are happening online so you can access them right from the comfort of your own home. It's the same great content without any of the travel time or childcare constraints. You can even jump in while you're eating dinner. Maybe this season has shown you some cracks in your marriage that you know need attention. Maybe all this time with your kids has made you wonder how you can better leverage the time with them. Maybe you feel paralyzed by a decision you have to make and you don't know what God's will is. Are you having conversations with others who have questions about God's goodness in all of this and you don't know quite what to say? 
All our equip classes have you covered with Marriage Matters, Biblical Parenting, The Will of God, and Defending the Faith. Every class is free. It's a super convenient way to take an equip class. Don't miss this incredible opportunity. Sign up today by clicking the link, which is available on all our platforms where our services are streaming. Let's turn our attention now to God's Word as we continue in our Finally Free Sermon series. Hey guys, welcome to Mercy Hill, especially if you are newer with us this weekend, maybe it's even your first time. Uh, We would love to hear from you, get a chance to uh, connect with you and see how you found out about Mercy Hill. Whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on YouTube, whether you're seeing this on our church website, there is a connect card that you can fill out there. We would love to hear from you in that. Hey, before I dive into the sermon, I do want to do this as well. And this might take me a minute, okay? So let's just talk for a minute uh, about the reopening, all right? I know people are thinking about that with phase one. I know as phase two is coming and all of that, we're all anxious to have our buildings open, backed up and all that. Um, I wanted to take a minute, y'all, and kind of reframe some of that question because the way I've heard it said is like, hey, when is Mercy Hill going to reopen? I wanna make sure everybody understands. Mercy Hill doesn't need to reopen because the church never closed, okay? We have been open, wide open, nonstop. Man, the church never cancels. It just continues in a new way. And we have seen that like crazy. Y'all, multiple people connecting into brand new small groups, more group numbers than we've had uh, over this last pandemic you know, kind of last couple months of the pandemic than we've had maybe over the last few months before that. Um, People have been diving back in. We have been doing a lot of things by seeing, uh, like seeing new people jump onto our online giving platforms. We've had kids literally getting saved and hearing from parents every single week pretty much um, that we have been off in terms of our buildings being closed. So y'all, I just wanna try to reframe that question a little bit and make sure everybody understands the church is not a building, the church is a movement. And the church doesn't stop just because we get thrown a little bit of a curveball. Now, with that said, I fully understand the sentiment and I feel the sentiment, which is, man, all of us want to get back together. All of us want to get back to uh, being able to gather in our buildings and student ministry and kids ministry and being mobilized for mission trips and all that stuff. Man, I want that. I know that you want that. But as we begin to ask the question of when will we open up our buildings, we've got to remember the church is not a building, the church is a movement. And this movement moves in a lot of different ways all around the world. Right now, we've got to be asking the question of effectiveness uh, more than when can we and, and all of this kind of stuff, all right? I think there's a few things that we've got to think about, namely just two. Let me knock these out and we'll dive uh, into the sermon. The first question, I think, for this idea of when we should open the buildings, I think the best way to ask it is this. When will opening the buildings be the most effective way that we can fulfill our mission to make disciples and to multiply churches? That's the question. Not necessarily even can we, the question is when can we effectively as we continue to make disciples and to multiply churches. In other words, and we say this a lot around Mercy Hill, hey, just because we can doesn't mean that we should. If we can open the buildings, but because of the current pandemic and everything going on, everybody's gonna have to sit five feet, you know, five seats apart and everyone's gonna have to wear a mask and there can't be any uh, children's services because as you know, kids don't know how to do social distancing and there is no coffee, okay? Some of you are like, well, I don't love the coffee anyway, maybe, or whatever. Um, But when you think about that and you think about all the things that we have to do, then it seems like maybe the buildings are not the right tool for this moment. Maybe what we're doing right now is the most effective thing. And we've just got to remember that. I can just imagine... You know, Anna trying to sit in a service listening to a sermon and trying to fight, you know, she was trying to fight Faith Ann to get a mask on her because she's over two years old. It would just be a nightmare. So the question isn't when can we? The question is about effectiveness and fruitfulness, okay? Um, We gotta be asking questions more like, is this the best way to do ministry right now? To, to, To be in a rush to throw the buildings open or to continue to steward the church's resources by creating an online product that can reach people, all right? When can we open in a more effective way? 
effective way. I think you can think about it like this. Y'all, when the buildings become the most effective way, that's probably when we're going to be getting close to wanting to open up and use them again. But right now, we're not there. Um, looking forward to that day, but that is the way that we're thinking about it, right? Hey, the second thing in that, and it brings up, because I know, um, here, here's what I know. Whenever we do open the buildings back up at Mercy Hill, there's going to be some that felt like it was too early and some that felt like it was too late. There's as many opinions as there are people that comprise Mercy Hill Church that think about this issue and have thoughts on this issue. So what I need to absolutely call our church to is a John 17 type of love for one another that ends up confounding the world. It won't matter if we open a month early or two weeks later or whatever. That's not gonna matter nearly as much as the way that we treated each other and thought about it in the process. The spirit that we had in terms of trying to figure it out. Man, do we have grace for each other? Hey, pray for wisdom for me, for our pastors at at Mercy Hill. Man, we're trying to do the right thing. We wanna make the best decisions for our church and we're navigating a lot of different stuff. So I just pray that you'll be gracious with us and let's continue to lean into ministry in the best way that we can right now because we're seeing some amazing things uh, and maybe God is doing some things and shaking us up during this time. And so we don't wanna jump out of that too early. We wanna lean into what he's doing, all right? Now, let's dive into Romans chapter eight. Here's the big idea. Creation longs for the glory of God to be revealed. I wanna talk to you guys today from Romans eight about the fact that this whole idea of salvation is not just about the individual soul, but it is cosmic, okay? We are not the only ones that wait for the glory of God to be revealed. Talked a lot about heaven last week. Talked a lot about the new heavens and the new earth. Y'all, we are not the only ones. Paul in this passage in Romans 8 personifies creation. Okay, it's not a mother earth thing where the creation is God. Or, and don't, don't, don't go there. You got to understand it's, an, it's a tool of writing. He personifies creation in his writing to make sure we understand that creation itself is going to be redeemed and creation longs for the glory of God. Creation longs, it waits, it stands on its tippy toes to catch a glimpse. It groans to see the glory of God revealed in the world because it too will be renewed. You remember uh, as a kid, maybe your family was going to take a trip. Or maybe something was going on like a birthday or something like that, right? And you would get your calendar out and, and you would begin to mark off the days. Every day you, you mark off a day, you know, you're getting closer and closer and closer. Man, the creation is doing that. It waits, it longs, it groans for that day when the glory of God is going to be revealed. Uh, I thought about this when I was in college, my first year of college. Man, I'm a homebody and all of a sudden I find myself three states away all my boys are back home, my family's back home, and I began to realize, like, man, I'm, I'm six weeks away, I'm four weeks away, I'm two weeks away from Christmas break, you know, getting to go home for a month, and man, marking off the days. Y'all, creation does that when it thinks about, again, remember, we're personifying creation here, it's not a Mother Earth thing, but it's the way that we're thinking about uh, from creation's perspective, Paul's gonna say, creation is waiting and longing in that way for the revelation of the glory of God. Why? Because human sin, but creation felt the pain. The curse of sin went all the way into the dirt. And when the glory of God is revealed, it will be reversed as far as the curse is found. Everything that is sad will become untrue and creation will feel that. It will be freed from the bondage of decay. This is what we're talking about in this series. Y'all, Jesus came to bring more freedom, not less. He came to bring a freedom that is cosmic and it should shape the way that we think about the very earth underneath our feet and the way that we interact with creation. That's what we're gonna talk about. Romans chapter eight. Y'all, we're gonna start here in verse 18. Uh, just, just quickly though, let me say this. I had a guy tell me one time for Mercy Hill on a mission trip. It was so funny. He said to me, hey man, I tell all my friends, okay, uh, man, when you listen to Andrew preach, three, of the, three out of four sermons are going to be awesome and the other one's weird, okay? This one is a weird one. I'm just going to be honest with you. Because, and why? Because Christians aren't normal. They're thoughtful. They're not normal. They're thoughtful. And we got to be thoughtful about the very dirt underneath our feet. And the way that we act about this creation, and that's what the Bible's gonna push us to. Look at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing, that's the big word here, comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Y'all, we experience suffering and we wait, we long for that day when the glory of God is revealed. We say, hey, the suffering now is not worth even comparing to, that's what Paul says here. He says, I consider, he says, that means I've thought about it. I've read about it. I've studied about it. And I think that the sufferings of this present time are not worth being compared to the glory that is going to be revealed to us or revealed in us. Hey, the same way that for us, future glory far outweighs present suffering. 
For the same way that for us, we think about future glory and we say, man, it's not that the present suffering isn't real, but we all understand that the, as believers, the present suffering gets displaced. It is outweighed by the future glory. What the Bible is going to show us today is we're not the only ones who think like that. That for creation, it's the same way. That for them, suffering will be displaced by glory. What it's saying here is not that suffering isn't real. What it's saying is that suffering is a light and momentary affliction. Paul said another place in the Bible. It is not even worthy of being compared. Uh, you could say it like this. It's not even worthy of being on the same field. You think about a dynasty, you think about the U in the 80s, you think about Alabama, you think about uh, the Bulls in the 90s or whatever. It's like, man, the other teams didn't even belong on the same field as them. It, this is what it's getting at, is that the, there's a, the suffering that we face now is going to be so far outweighed by what we see then. Paul is a guy, I want you to understand, who was shipwrecked, snake bitten. He was beaten with, uh, he, he was beaten to a bloody pulp. He was stoned, caught up in the third heaven. I mean, all this crazy stuff, and yet he's willing to say, man, all the suffering now, it's not that it ain't real. But when you think about what it compares to, oh, it's going to be so far outweighed by the glory that is to come. Remember I said last week, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. It's the gain that makes the pain worth it. It's the crown that makes the cross worth it. You think about Jesus setting his face towards joy and he endures the cross. The cross was unpleasant. The cross was suffering. The cross was hard. But it was outweighed by the joy. We had one guy uh, on our staff. I thought this was pretty funny. Uh, he was, uh, man, he was getting in really good shape for one of these, you know, how ripped can you get in 90 days or 120 days or whatever. And, uh, and man, before that, he was working out. He, was, he had all this dietary stuff. And I remember one night, a few of us were watching a, a football game. I think we were watching the National Championship football game. And he was, he was there, and you know, it's, those games go late. It's probably 11 o'clock at night or something. Well, somebody orders uh, a bunch of pizza, and they have it delivered, okay? Man, we're sitting there. He's sitting there. I could see the battle in his face. I could just see the anguish, okay? National championship, bunch of dudes sitting around uh, at night. Man, I could just see in him all the pizza, carbs, cheese, all this kind of stuff, all, all the bad stuff he's not allowed to have when he's on this kind of get-ripped plan. And, of course, we're making it real easy on him. I mean, just smacking right in his face. I mean, just taking the pizza, <laughs> terrible as it is, right under his nose so he could smell it, you know. But here's the thing. He stayed strong. It was a light and momentary deal. Now, a couple months later, y'all, this dude gets an email. It says, bro, hundreds of people tried out in this competition. You won. You won the competition. He actually won a Rolex, if you can believe. I mean, brand new, in the box, Rolex. Okay, if you see one of the pastors at Mercy Hill wearing a Rolex, I don't want to, I don't want to email about, uh, you know, salary packages or whatever. Okay, he won the thing. But you, he won this Rolex watch. My point is this, man, the pizza was a real thing, but it's a long gone distant memory when you get the email that says that you won, right? The present sufferings, man, we feel this. I think about things that we have in our world right now that are not funny like that. Man, they're serious. Fear, pandemic, economy. You know, I think about our black brothers and sisters right now, just the sheer imagery of what is going on with the Ahmaud Arbery uh, death and, and the cultural pain and history that it brings up. And yet, even for something like that, Paul is saying here, the suffering doesn't compare to the glory. Remember, Paul didn't say it don't hurt. He said it doesn't compare with what is coming. The peer and the, the pain and the fear, the disappointment, they are real, but they will give way to joy. They are real. Make no mistake, though, heaven is on the way. And the point is, and why I'm trying to frame all this up, is, y'all, it's not just on the way for us, and we're not the only ones who the glory outweighs the suffering. That is true for creation as well. Look at verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation itself longs for the day when glory outweighs the suffering. Creation, not just us, it waits for that day when the suffering is displaced. Now, one of the things that we gotta do here, and I wanna slow down and just make sure we, we dive all the way in. You know, we've gotta go a little bit deeper here and we've gotta ask some of the 2.0 questions, okay? Because some of this is real simple, right? Like, okay, like we suffer, but we know glory's coming. Creation suffers, but glory is coming. Yes, but what did the Bible actually say in verse 19? Because this is where it gets deep. It said that the glory of God is revealed to us, revealed in us. But verse 19 said that the creation waits for uh, the glory, it, it, but, but creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Okay, it didn't use the language of the glory of God to us. The we wait for the glory of God to be revealed to us. The creation waits for us to be revealed to them. 
Now, to it. Now, what does this mean? Again, Paul is personifying the language here. He's talking from creation's perspective, but here's what it means. Try to grasp, try to grasp this. From the perspective of creation, the revealing of God's glory comes in the form of the revealing of the sons of God. Oh my, something about the renewal, something about the new heavens and the new earth, something about the pain of creation ceasing, something about creation marking its calendar off for the day that it awaits, something about creation standing up on its tiptoes to get a glimpse of what is coming, something about that is totally wrapped up in our place in the kingdom of God, about, the glory, about our glorification, about our restoration, when the creation longs and groans, it longs and groans for humans to take their rightful place as the stewards of creation, that our relationship with creation would be restored once again. So many of us, and I've lived a lot of my life this way as well, and I'm not saying I totally got this, all right? But I do think many of us, and I don't know why this is, but it is particularly strong in the West, Many of us live our life in about two inches of water when it comes to the theology of how God wants humanity to interact with creation. We feel these longings, but we don't understand how they all work together. Meaning, I understand from Genesis, like, okay, I was created to worship and obey. We were all created to tend and keep and care for the garden. Like we understand that God wanted us to take what he created and to create with it, but to leave it better than we, let, leave it better than we found it, to heal with it, to, to bring goodness from it. We understand that, but some kind of way in a world of Uber and iPhones and Instagram and Robin Hood, we don't quite understand exactly how it is that we are supposed to interact with creation. Here we are thinking, man, I cut my grass because I don't want the HOA to get after me. Or here we are thinking I go work every day just so I can make money. Or here we are thinking the connection between the earth and what I eat and consume doesn't matter. Or here we are thinking I go walking on trails just for exercise, missing the idea of my place in creation. Y'all, we walk by these things is my point. We have little hints of them all of the time, but we don't quite grasp it. And what I want to do is to point us back right here to Romans chapter 8 and show you very explicitly he is making a connection. It is a simple truth that maybe can ignite a passion for creation in us. Here's the simple truth. Creation doesn't wait for the revealing of the sons of God only because that means creation's moment has come. Creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God because humans in their rightful place are part of the creation, uh, part of the restoration. They are part of the redemption. That humans, assuming their role, you can say it another way, you don't get the new heavens and the new earth without the children of God being stewards of that new earth. You don't get to the, the earth being healed without humans getting their dirt, getting their fingernails into, <coughs> into the dirt. This is what we were created for. This is what we were supposed to do. Y'all, we were always supposed to be interjected into a system for its good. We get hints of this when we create a garden. We get hints of this when the family dog is really healthy because we exercise him. We get hints of this when we enjoy being outside. We get hints of this when we enjoy finishing and seeing the neatness of a project that we have created. God made us for these things, okay? And we will be stewards of the earth once again. This is, by the way, the total problem with modern environmentalism because it assumes that humans are the problem because it looks in and sees many humans act in a problematic way. But what I would say is when you see humans crushing the environment, they are sinning. They are working against God's design. Isn't it funny in, the, in, our, in our culture? It's like we have these polar kind of ideas. Either people worship creation and push humans down, or they want to almost worship humanity by pushing creation down. You know, consuming, just use it up and throw it away as if it's a nothing. And here it is. It's always this way with Christianity. It's always this way in the Bible with a third way, a more thoughtful way that says, man, you're not supposed to worship it, but you're also not supposed to undervalue it. You're supposed to value it without worshiping it. You are a steward of it. When the environmentalist with the modern secular kind of arm uh, comes in and says, hey, that humans are bad for the earth, you've seen bad examples, but humans were created for this type of work. God didn't create humans to be bad for the earth. He created it the other way around. I, I would say it like this. What you actually see that's a problem is you, you think, man, humans need less interaction. No, the Bible's calling you to have more in a good way, in a healing way. Verse 20 says this, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, 
only but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Adam sinned and subjugated creation to its futility. It was bound to decay. Everything we see feels like it's on a down escalator. I mean, it feels like it's breaking down all of the time. That's what the Bible says happened because of sin. We sinned, but the earth felt the shock. Genesis 3, 17. God looks at Adam and he says, cursed is the very ground because of you. Because what you have done has done it to you. I mean, think about Isaiah chapter 24. The earth mourns. Verse 6 says, therefore a curse devours the earth. Verse 19 says, the earth is utterly broken, the earth is split apart, the earth violently shakes, creation groans. It is bound to decay and it suffers because of the sin of the world. I would say it looks primarily two ways when you think about it practically. Creation groans because it's broken, it's all out of whack, and creation groans because humans bro- you know, steward it in a broken way. I mean, number one, it's just broken, it's all out of whack. Pandemics, tsunamis, fires that rage. You know, you think about 2017, over $300 billion from storm damage of natural disasters in our country alone, but then come humanity with all the ingenuity that God has given them for the purpose of healing the earth and bringing forth from it what is supposed to be good, and we take all that ingenuity and we crumple it up and throw it away. We strip mine. You literally need a hazmat suit to walk into a chicken house right here in our state. 18 trillion pounds of plastic produced in the last 60 years. You can still find remnants of the atomic bombs that were tested 70 years ago floating around, even in ice caps. You think about how you look around the world with things that just, you see, I mean, think about the Ganges River in India. You go ahead and Google pictures of where it begins and where it ends. It begins in the icy, cold, clear waters of the Himalayas. You go look at pictures of it after it has had a, 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 this is hard to even think about, a billion gallons of waste pumped in it every single day. You see the pictures of it after all of that has happened to it. Y'all, this is what has gone on. The creation is broken and the creation has not been stewarded well from humanity. But here's what the Bible is saying, and this is where we have hope today. Those groans are not despair because the joy is going to come. See, the Bible tells us there's coming a day, Isaiah 55, 12 says, where the mountains are gonna sing and the trees are gonna clap. There is a joy that is coming. Look, it will be freed, verse 21. And the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption, obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pangs of childbirth until now. What it's saying is, that's the last scripture, there's a freedom coming from the bondage of decay that came through sin. There is a freedom coming. You know, I want you to think about that. In our bodies, we look forward to that. We look forward to it in creation as well. There is a freedom that is coming. And what he uses is an example here of childbirth, okay? I want you to think about childbirth. Man, in childbirth, there is pain, okay? Particularly for the man involved. Okay, I'm, that's a joke, all right? But I do think, uh, I do remember, you know, and very traumatic, uh, you know, for me, of course, I'm sitting there and they're telling me to cut the cord. I about passed out, okay? By the third child, we're in there right now, and uh, literally my wife and the doctor, babies being born, are commenting on the TV that's playing in the background. The TV show is Say Yes to the Dress. I'm telling everybody they need to get their head back in the game here, okay? Uh, it was just a little bit, you know. But when you think about, the, I mean, I'm just kind of being funny, but you think about the pain for a woman during childbirth, how intense it is. And yet, what comes is such joyful that she's willing to do it again, <laughs> You know, it's, it's insane when you go through and you go, man, that has got to be the most painful thing. And then yet a woman is joyful to say, man, I'll do that again. I, I, I see the joy that came from the pain. And that is what we have here. You know, you walk into a hospital, every part of the hospital has groans. Every part of a hospital, man, there's groaning and there's, sa- and, and, and there's people that are crying out in pain. And yet there's one wing of the hospital where those cries of pain are totally joyful right? And that is the example that he is using here. He is saying, no, 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 we don't suffer like everybody else. There's not hopelessness. Yes, we see despair and pain all around, but these things are going to end. They will cease and we can have a hope. And that hope is from creation's perspective that the sons of God, the children of God, remember sons means heir. He's talking about all of us, that the sons of God will be fully revealed. And when they do, they will take their rightful place over creation and they will steward it well. And creation wants to clap and to sing. Y'all want to call you guys to one application point today. And it's this, long for the glory of God to be revealed in full. Long for that day, all right? 
Uh, man, it's, it's so funny and it's so ironic. We live in an age where the secular environmental message is you are a part of creation. Okay, that's it. You're no more than that. You're a part of creation. And yet you are supposed to be the one that cares for it extensively and, 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 and it takes responsibility for it and all of that. It makes no sense at all. I mean, I think about this. I'm like, okay, what you know, grizzly bear has ever kind of thought about it after his third salmon and thought, well, I better stop eating salmon because you know, we got to make sure they have their population numbers. All right. That's insane that we are just a part of creation and yet we are set up to steward it and care for it. No way. The Bible has the answer here. And we all know it, I think, in our gut. And that is this, that the true message about our interaction with creation and the one that makes the most sense is not to say that you are a generic part of creation, but it is to say that while you are a part of creation, you are set apart from creation. You are the crown jewel in this whole deal. You are the prize of his creation. You are the apple of his eye. When God made you, he broke the mold. And what he wanted you to do was to steward everything else around you well. That there would be wellness in the gardens of your life. There would be wellness around you, wellness in the world, because you are here, you are interjected into this system for the system's good. And I wanna talk about practical ways that we can long for the glory of God to be revealed. One of the practical ways that we can is we can just, we can just sit and believe. You know, there's not a lot of imperatives in this passage, not a lot of commands. So one of the things that we need to do before we get to the, well, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z, is we just need to believe in the way that God is calling us to believe. And here's what God is calling us to believe today, that he cares about the whole world. The salvation is not just about the individual soul. It is cosmic in scope. There is not one square inch of this universe that God has not declared, this is mine. He began with dirt in his fingernails. He ejected his children of Israel out of their homeland because they failed in, in one part, Second Corinthians, uh, I mean, Second Chronicles 26, uh, 36 tells us, because the children of Israel failed to do right by the earth. They failed to let the earth Sabbath. You know, all of these things, my point is we gotta believe that God cares. God created a garden and he will not abandon it. And part of that garden is you and I as stewards taking our rightful place. It costs God dearly to bring us back and to put us in our rightful place. I want you to think about this with me. What did it cost for God to set us back into our place as rightful stewards and to purchase for us the new heavens and the new earth with our place intact? It cost the blood of Christ. Suffering was revealed to Jesus so that glory could be revealed to us that we could be interjected into this system again. And my question is, if God cares about it that much, if he cared enough for you to put you back in your rightful place, then shouldn't we long for the day when we have an opportunity to step back into our role? Hey, can you wait for the day when the mountains sing and the trees clap, not just because of God, but because God has restored us to our rightful place to care for them, okay? Now we get to the to-dos. Because I know some of you are watching this and maybe you've never thought about these things in this way or not, but some of you are thinking to yourself, okay, here's the part where he tells me to drive an electric car, really? You honestly think the battery that can uh, move an electric car down the road is any better for creation than the exhaust created by a combustion engine? The answer to that is, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's like, man, do you really know? Okay, you've done one, you know, it's like, okay, I've thought about it for one car. Well, how about when every car in the whole universe, you know, the whole world is replaced? Is it really better? This is my point in bringing up that wrestling match, okay? I'm not about to give you a bunch of rules of things you need to do or not do. Instead, I want to try to wake you up to the fact that the church is called to creation thoughtfulness. That is part of longing, okay? Part of longing for what God is gonna do then, restoring us to our rightful stewardship to take care of, to be like a good king who the subjects, meaning the earth, longs for that day when we were restored to our reign, all right? We, we're gonna look at that and we're gonna say, hey, if I'm gonna think about heaven in that way, and I'm gonna realize that God has that for me there, then I've gotta be willing to realize that part of the longing uh, 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 of seeing his glory revealed is taking my part in what I can do in that arena right now. I mean, some of us have never even thought about these things, but I would call you to this. Man, do you think about creation care? Do you love creation care? If we don't love creation care, why in the world do we think we would love heaven? I mean, that we're being restored to being caretakers of the garden. You say, well, is everybody gonna become a farmer or what, what are you kind of getting at here? Man, I'm not getting at that at all. 
I'm not saying in heaven everybody becomes a farmer, that we should do that now by any means. I mean, think about the, the end of the Bible. Man, we start in a garden, we end in a city, okay? We understand the new Jerusalem uh, descends like a bride, but it is, it is a city. I'm not trying to get at this ethereal, frolicking in the woods kind of theology. I'm just trying to make the point that every one of us have everyday decisions that we need to make, and the totality of our life needs to lean more toward and, and get more toward the idea of the way I interact with creation needs to be holy holistic, whole, uh, healthy, that's what I want to get at. So uh, real quick here, I've landed on four things that I want to tell you, all right? The first one is this. If you're like, man, I want to start going down this road, um, I, I, I'm body, I, I see what you're saying, and part of longing for the glory of God is, part, is longing for creation and all that. What do I do? Four things. Number one, start asking some questions, okay? You say, well, what kind of questions? Let me give you an example. Um, man, are we asking the question, is what we eat raised in a way that honors God? Are we asking a question, hey, is the way we, re- we consume material possessions something that honors God? Are we asking questions like this that are deeper? I kind of threw off the little bombshell with the, with the car batteries and all that. Hey, does recycling help or hurt the environment if it promotes the use of single-use plastics? These are things that we just got to wrestle with. I'm not trying to give you a bunch of answers or rules. These are things that we've got to answer. We've got to kind of answer in our heart with our conscience and wrestle with. Man, if I feel like I'm a little bit lost in these discussions, uh, what can I do? Hey, you can go to your group this week and ask everybody to do this. Man, what about saying, hey, this is a step that I want to take? You know, this is a step that I want to take. Uh, you know, if it means these questions are you know, questions like this, maybe even questions that are as small as, I mean, you know, does the fertilizer that makes the yard green actually make the yard uh, healthy? I mean, these are questions that we have got to be asking. Number two, change the way that we think about things. All right. I've tried to do that in this sermon. I've tried to shake the sand under you. I've tried to kind of bring the roof off the, and let the sun kind of shine in a little bit here. If you want to go deeper into this, then there's a lot of resources that you can grab onto. Two of the ones that I have that I really, that I really love are Francis Schaeffer's book, Genesis and Space and Time, and a guy named Joel Salatin's book that I, I put, point you to. Uh, interesting title here, The Marvelous Pigness of a Pig. Okay, uh, But I know that sounds a little bit odd. You might want to dive into that. Hey, thirdly, man, go outside. Interact with creation. Get some dirt under your fingernails. Uh, I thought about this uh, just because I've been watching kind of the trends. You know, when the, phase, when the shutdown happened, everybody went outside. The trails around Greensboro were so slammed. It's the second phase one was instituted, all those people went back to Target. Okay, not, not all those people. But it, it felt like all of a sudden there was an emptying from creation. And now all of a sudden we've rushed back to our consumer uh, kind of mentality. Hey, let's go outside. And the fourth thing I would say is this, man, you can feel the groan in your soul. That's okay. I think sometimes, our tra- I think sometimes as, man, even as men, it's like, man, we want to harden ourselves against the tragedies that we see in creation. We don't need to do that. We need to feel creation groan and allow it to fuel longing for what God is doing in heaven, all right? Hey, conclusion, two things. Number one, are you wrestling with this stuff at all? And if you're not, is it because you're not a believer? Maybe you have bought into the hype. Maybe you've bought into the part that you are kind of a part of creation. What I want you to see is the Bible says that your interaction with creation isn't supposed to be less. It's actually supposed to be more. I bet you feel that in your bones. Listen, Jesus bought for you an incredible future. And that future is that you would be restored to those glimpses that you feel where you're like, man, I kind of feel like I'm supposed to, I feel like a human's supposed to be, yeah. All of that times a million, that's what he has for you uh, in the kingdom, all right? I hope that maybe you'll explore this a little bit further. And Christian, you know, what do we need to do to change? Uh, How are we longing uh, to seek what God, you know, how are we longing to seek uh, the glory of God and all of that? How are we uh, stewarding creation? If we don't love it here, are we going to love it there? Uh, All of that. Y'all, I I want you to think about uh, the way that we're longing for creation. This um, was funny. This week, um, my, my, uh, my third child, our, our five-year-old, uh, for some reason he was talking about weddings and he started asking us about our honeymoon. And uh, I said, yeah, we, we went to the mountains or whatever. And, and he was like, you know, what's a honeymoon? And I was like, well, you know, it's like a celebration of the wedding. And, and he's like, well, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do on my honeymoon. I was like, what? He's like, I'm going to Florida. I said, oh, you're gonna go to Florida. I was thinking like Disney World or something like that. I was like, I was like what are you gonna do? He's like, I'm going to stay with Papa and Gigi on my honeymoon. Uh, I was like, you're going to go stay at Papa and Gigi's house for your honeymoon. He said, yeah. And, um, and my wife can sleep with Gigi and I can sleep with Papa. <laughs> and I was like, but I'm not sure you quite got the concept of a honeymoon, okay? Uh, but it was, it was funny to me and I was thinking about that. Oh, and the reason why he was asking, this is why. The reason why he was asking was because this past week was me and Anna's 15-year wedding anniversary, okay? So uh, we, were, we were really uh, excited, a little tough to celebrate and go away or, or any of that. But it was, man, it was just a cool, you know, th- man, God's been gracious 15 years. But I just started thinking about weddings and, you know, all these, we were looking at pictures and all this stuff. And I started thinking about the anticipation of the wedding, you know, and 
man, how you long for it, and you're marking off the days, and there's a, man, what the Bible said creation does is an eager anticipation, you know, an eager waiting of what, of what is to come. Part, and this is the last thing I'll say, y'all, part of whether or not we are longing, eagerly waiting, standing on our tiptoes for the glory of God to be revealed, a part of that is how we treat the earth. And in the way that we treat the earth and the way that we long, we can confound the culture around us, all right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your word and have it push us on something that uh, might be a little outside the box, might be a little bit of something that we didn't see coming. God, you care about every square inch of this universe. Lord, you have put us in a rightful place and a special place over, and I pray that we will steward it well. God, and that we will long for your glory to be revealed to us so that we can be the good stewards of the earth that you have called us to be in Christ's name, amen. Amen. We are going to continue worshiping now through our giving. Generosity fuels the mission. Mercy Hill has sent members all around the world to live and work in places where many have never heard the good news of Jesus. This week, Pastor Brian checked in on a few of them to hear how they are staying encouraged and connected during lockdown. Check out this video. Well, hey guys, thank you so much for joining in. It's so exciting to uh, see you guys. And so for those of you who are currently abroad, how have you adapted uh, in your strategies to try to continue outreaching people? Or, or how have you just seen God at work during this time? I think in God's grace and sovereignty, we live in a time where we are able to access people through technology, which has been huge on Easter, I was able to send a video of me sharing the gospel in my new language to some of my neighbors and friends. And for two of them who I had just started forming relationships with, it was the first time that they had ever heard. A friend that I was meeting with every week, she actually offered to keep meeting over uh, FaceTime. So we've been able to continue having gospel conversations over FaceTime, which has been awesome. Um, and then he's been able to keep in contact with employees through daily meetings and continuing to have uh, cultural and then that usually leads to spiritual conversations just through workplace relationships that way. Wow, that's really cool to hear. What have been some sources of encouragement for you guys uh, during this time? How have you been able to stay connected? I think one thing that is cool is we're kind of experiencing Mercy Hill the same way everybody else is right now. You know, like we're used to it being online, but it's cool to know we're in that with others. We've been able to join our community group on Tuesday nights, and that has been really helpful. It feels like we're still in Greensboro with everybody. Um, it's also just been really helpful to that the whole service is online now. You know, like you know that everyone is also worshiping to that same song in their houses as well. It's made us feel a lot more connected uh, and encouraged in this time. We've had Mercyville church services every Sunday morning here, which has been awesome. We've even taken communion with you guys. Um, through Gatorade and I think an Oreo or something. <laughs> um, but that was really cool. We've also been doing the Mercy Hill Kids online stuff with um, our supervisor's family. And then at dinner, we were talking about the Bible and he just immediately started doing like gospel <laughs> hand motions. So that was like really cool to see how like our sending churches resources is fueling even like this kid who's on the field learning how to share. Thank you guys so much for sharing and just how things are where you are and, and how you see God still at work. Um, you guys are family to us. We love you guys. We're praying for you and hope to see you guys soon. Church, it is your generosity that allows our missionaries to serve in the context they are living in. And it is your generosity that is enabling them to participate in our Mercy Hill services, even though they are in a different part of the world. Imagine what we could see in the future if we continue to be faithful to give. We've seen over a thousand people baptized right here at Mercy Hill, but we have a vision of seeing 500 baptizers sent out from Mercy Hill to go all over the world and baptize others, all the while being ministered to and encouraged by staying connected to Mercy Hill worship services and their Mercy Hill family online. 
It is now easier than ever to give to Mercy Hill to fuel the mission going forward. Last month, we launched a brand new giving platform called Secure Give. With this new platform, it is now quicker and easier to give a one-time gift or to set up reoccurring giving. The migration to this new platform will also save the church money, which is why we are taking down the old platform at the end of this month. To give for the first time or to switch your giving from our old platform, please text MHGIVE to 41411. Let's continue to worship now as we sing about the promises of God.
All of God's promises are yes and amen. Hey, wherever you are watching this today, I wanna thank you for joining us. I hope you have been encouraged by this service. Please know that in addition to our online services every week, we have created online resources for individuals and families to grow spiritually. You can access community group materials, a full Mercy Hill Kids service, resources for our student ministry, and opportunities to serve our community all on our website. Also, be sure to like and subscribe on our Facebook and YouTube pages so you can receive the latest content from Mercy Hill. To give and support the mission of Mercy Hill, you can simply text MHGIVE to 41411. Also, our pastoral team would love to pray for you. You can request prayer through our website. God has freed, called, and equipped every believer to be on mission for such a time as this. Mercy Hill, you are sent out.